Hello, um, I'm Ash Kandekar, the editor of Opera Now, and I'm really delighted to be hosting this session with really one of our most treasured performers. He's, he's, a, he's a wonderful singer, a terrific composer, um, you, know, you know, a Renaissance man, really. He does, he does a bit of everything. So um, uh, I'm really delighted to introduce Roderick Williams. Hello. Um, and we're going to have a wide ranging conversation and we're really hoping that you'll all join in to this peculiar world of Zoom and um, give us some, some great questions to ask, ask Roderick, um, who's actually been quite busy, I think, um, this year through COVID in spite, in spite of everything. So do tell us a little bit about what you've been doing, Roddy. Well, uh, it started for me at the end of May and into June when we began to make the first tentative steps to voice and piano uh, performance. Um, without audience, so streaming things, and I was one of the f one of the people in the first group of uh, Wigmore Hall concerts that John Gilhooly put in place there. So to an empty hall, but just with the cameras up and it was on the radio, uh, because you know I'm I'm roughly speaking two meters away from the pianist at any given moment, uh, and voice and piano in terms of chamber music was one of the first things to come to be to be allowed to be able to come back into existence, um, and kind of ever since June that idea of recitals um, has has remained. Uh, Sholto Kainach, for example, at the Oxford Leader, he took a decision early in the in the in lock the first lockdown that the Oxford Leader Festival would continue in October. Um, not quite exact not exactly as he'd planned it, but he knew it would be online. And he took that decision early so that there was a degree of certainty. You, you cast your mind back, it was the uncertainty that was killing everybody. Would we be allowed to go back again in July or would it maybe be September before we could perform before audiences? And it began to be slowly apparent that that was not going to happen either. Um, and gradually through the autumn, I've managed to perform with progressively larger and larger ensembles, um, chamber orchestras, sometimes single strings and single woodwind, and then, you know, maybe a couple of desks of, of strings. Uh, as spaces got larger and the rules relaxed a little bit, there was the outdoor Lab OM with English National Opera, for example, in September, as, a, as the only time since March that I've done something operatic on, on stage in front of an audience. They were in their cars. but um, So all that sort of thing has been going, even through this, this second lockdown in November, um, I had a small number of, of live concerts that were cancelled immediately but much of the rest of the work I was doing was going to be streamed anyway or was going to be in a recording studio uh, without audience so all of those things have been allowed to, uh, permitted to continue so that's you know it's been ongoing ever since. Yeah, I, mean, I mean what you say about certainty and, and uncertainty has been one of those sort of defining features of the past few months that we've been living in. I mean, I mean, the idea that you, you just can't plan anything is, is really difficult. And um, presumably, I mean, have you learnt resources to be able to think on your feet in, in a way that you never thought you'd have to? Um, and also things like, you know, singing outside and singing in settings that you're just you're just not used to singing it uh, necessarily. I mean, presumably you'd have to re you've had to really adapt as a, as, as a performer. Yes, I, I think there was a lot. There's a lot of adapting going on. The, I think the first thing that struck me, well, right back in June at the Wigmore Hall, was singing without an audience. Um, so that was strange, and, uh, and, and, and because, of course, I do a lot of practice with my pianists. No, really, I do honestly do a lot of practice with my pianists, and and it's that's a, a wonderful atmosphere. Just me and the pianist. Uh, and we make great music and performance is different to that. And in putting that on stage at the Wigmore Hall, uh, we're asking ourselves, is this just another rehearsal or what makes it a performance if there's nobody here for me to communicate with? I mean, that, so that was an interesting and ongoing question. I did something with Ian Burnside at, um, uh, at Grange for Waspikani yeah. and I was performing straight into a, a, a camera and that felt very odd. It, we were at a very strange angle on stage in order to get the cameras in and everything, and that, and that felt that felt really weird. So I had to adapt 
very that, much to did, that. Did you, did you answer that question to yourself? I mean, is, was it a rehearsal or did you feel that there is an element of performance even in a in a darkened room with, with nobody watching sort of thing? So, uh... but it felt to me that that occasion singing into the, into the camera um, for, for Waspies uh, was, was more of a, 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 a relaxed comfortable atmosphere we we would try and do full takes but there was a feeling that if we messed up because of course it was my pretty much my first time back after two or two or three months of not singing at all um if i messed up we could just take it again and go again whereas the wigmore hall was a different thing um that was was me in a suit i hadn't i hadn't worn a suit just imagine i hadn't worn a performing suit a performance clothes for months um, and just seeing if I could fit back into it was one thing. So, and then standing on the stage and f not looking, uh, um, not turning around and facing the penis as I would in rehearsal, but turning around and facing the empty hall and singing down the length of it. That certainly felt like a performance. As it happened, and I was actually rather pleased this happened, it was Joe Middleton, Joseph Middleton was playing for me there. And because he wasn't allowed a page turner, he had invested in an iPad plus page turning pedal bluetooth connection or whatever it is and this was his first concert using that and in the middle of uh, the schumann frauen lieben und leben actually one of the hardest songs for me to remember so i was quite pleased it was going well in the middle of that song um it suddenly disconnected or something happened and the music disappeared off his screen and he kept going for a bit but they just had to stop um and it was a live concert uh and it was live on the radio and uh, we just had to restart that number and I thought that's brilliant that's what live music is about you get these unfortunate mishaps and well, we have to come together. Wonderful that you were singing Frauen Leben und Lieben because um, that's of course for a woman and, and maybe we should just sort of have a little discussion about that. Yes about, oh go on about, yes. <laughs> about the fact that you know as a singer we're not we're, as singers we're not so defined anymore by sort of voice types and genders and all those sorts of things so so um, what was it like singing uh, uh, essentially a song that you'd sort of turned into a, a sort of gay song cycle? Well, it's, it, it was interesting because, of course, I was I was at the same time inhabiting a, 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 a <laughs> inhabiting a woman's realm, while at the same time being a man. <laughs> so, we, <laughs> so let me just take the can that the can of can of whoops, just open it up because 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 I was not singing it uh, as a gay song cycle for one thing because uh, that's not the that's not the character that's in the poetry, particularly when it comes to talking about. Um, um, about the sixth song, I think it is, sixth, seventh song, talking about um, breastfeeding. So that was something that, yeah, that doesn't fit at all. But as in every other song cycle that I am able to inhabit, and that winterizer, or Die Schöne Millerin is a very good case in point, where I become a young Miller lad. You know, I'm 55, I'm not a young Miller lad. I wouldn't know, I w I've never milled in my life. <laughs> so it's all an act of imagination. And it, singing that Schumann allowed me to imagine in the way that Schumann did and the poet Albert uh, Chamiso imagined um, what it might be like to be female. And of course, if you look at it from a certain viewpoint, got it horribly wrong. If you, you know, you, you can choose your standpoint there, how you feel about the su our success in inhabiting what it is to be female. But it gave me a chance to empathise in that way. And I've sung it on a number of occasions now, and I find it, uh, uh, I find it hugely moving, personally, hugely engrossing. It's one of the strongest narrative song cycles that I, that I think I know, because uh, her journey, my journey, is so clear over those songs. The, the growing from someone with the, with, who, who, who is disbelieving that she, that she or I can be loved back into someone who becomes an equal with my partner to someone who then supersedes my partner. I just think it's an amazing journey. Yes, well, I think you've just really described the power of music. And um, if we're talking about, um, um, you know, empowerment and music and empowerment as a musician, you're, you're able to take people on those very extraordinary journeys, which I think, you know, often politicians can't. I mean, we get into into all sorts of sort of hot water about, you know, politically correct world about what we call people and what we do. I think music can actually make you viscerally feel um, mm. the, the difference and those transitions. And I think that's, you know, that I, th I thought it was a very interesting and, and, and brave thing to do. Thank you. Thank you. I enjoy, I, I'm very enjoyable. <laughs> I, I'll go with the brave because you said it, but enjoy. <laughs> 
from my point of view, hugely enjoyable. Mm. Great. So um, let's let's go back a little bit to how it, how it all began, because you said various things about your early life in in interviews with Opera Now and you know all over the place, and and you you weren't the the the, the one in the family who was actually cut out to be a musician from the start, were you? No, not especially. Uh, 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 my father uh, uh, retired as a management consultant um, some years ago uh, in the 1990s. And my mother did various things. She was a, a French teacher briefly and things like that. But they, they were both very musical, but they're not mu musicians. And nor were there people in, our, in, in their circle of friends who were professional musicians. So it kind of, it's kind of... It was outside my ken. Didn't know about this world at all. Uh, so it happened, but my older brother, Mark, has, has perfect pitch. And when he was a treble, um, he, uh, my parents sent him to the cathedral choir at Oxford, Christchurch Cathedral. He was there under Simon Preston. Um, and so I got into the habit of being taken, when I was younger, taken to, the, to visit him, you know, with my younger brother every fortnight or something like that um good old days of boarding school you know throw them in there <laughs> ignore them uh, no not ignored but um uh, so i got used to seeing my brother singing in services and when it finally when i was about the right age seven or eight then i followed him i didn't quite get into that choir but i went to the same school and when you're in a, in a, an, an environment like that singing and making music seems entirely natural um, that it's, it's such a, uh, a sort of logical, normal existence for me that I don't see anything strange, anything unusual, anything particularly noteworthy about it at all. It's just the way we made music. My parents love listening to classical music, amongst other things. Um, so there was lots of classical music in the house over the radio. Uh, but neither of my parents are particular performers. My father was a self-taught classical guitarist, so he would make music himself. We played recorder, um, you know, there's music going on, but no more so than in any other household. We were no Canet Mason. That was not, that was, you know, that we, we just, we were muddling through. How much, you, you know, you've, you've worked with many, many musicians and, you, and you've worked in many different contexts with musicians as well. I mean, how, how much do you think that sort of setting is almost a prerequisite if you're really going to make it in a, in, in a career? Or do you, do you think you can really, are we still, are we living in a society yet where you can sort of come from anywhere and, and, and if you've got the passion to do it, you can still do it? Yeah, it, it's, it's a great message that, isn't it? You know, you be what you want to be, just strive and you'll make it there in the end. I'm not so sure. It, it feels as though, uh, there, it, feel, it feels there are many different ways into it. One of the ways that we respond to greatly, all of us, when it's reported in magazines and in, in media, is the idea of the child seeing something like, for example, a famous trumpeter. They go at the age of four and they sit there with their mouths open and look at this trumpet and you kind of go, I, I want to play that. I've got to play that. That is my future. And they know from four or five or six years old. And that makes me think of, um, you know, uh, uh, life after death, sort of, you know, the, 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 this reincarnation that you were a trumpeter in a former life and you respond in some way. And, you, you know, I don't, what, whatever. But there's, there's that method that approach to it and there's the other thing which is the hard graft approach where later on in life it, it, of the choices open to you it becomes clear that you might like to try this one and pursue it for a bit and see if you're going to make it um and when i say and, and it could, when i say make it that then calls into question what you perceive as being making it is to be to have made it as a concert pianist does that mean you have to have the, the career of Stephen Osborne or Paul Lewis or something like that and be an international concert pianist playing concertos and, and, and what have you, recitals? Or would having made it be, um, I don't know what, a repetiteur at the Royal Opera House Covent Garden or a repetiteur with an independent opera company in this country or... Oh, well, that, that's an, yes, that's interesting to, to hear because did you therefore set a bar for yourself quite early on did you say this is where I would be happy to to be as a musician it, not particularly only because I don't think I really had the imagination um when I was setting out in my mid to mid to late 20s mid 20s uh, uh, to, uh, try this operatic career I don't think I had the imagination to work out what was possible and I, I may be doing myself a slight disservice here because I I always think back of myself as being terribly green and naive and a bit blinkered in terms of what was what was possible but 
I don't feel that at, at 25 or so, when I stopped my teaching career, classroom teaching career, and started singing, I don't think I looked at the Royal Opera House Covent Garden, for example, or the career of who? Um, Dmitry Rostovsky or Fischer Dieskow, say, and said, I want to be that and I can. And if I just struggle harder, if I really work, I could be Fischer Dieskow. I didn't say that to myself. I, I thought I, I'm going to do this um, and make music for as long as I can, as, as, as long as I'm still enjoying it. And if the ride comes to an end at some point, if it becomes clear that it's not, it's run its course, then I will be grateful for what I've had and return to my teaching or something else or whatever. Um, I, 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 I paint a picture of a man who didn't have I didn't have burning ambitions. I think that's probably. I think that's true. Okay, so so let's unpack that a little bit. I mean, you you started um, really embarking on your career at twenty five by the sounds of things when when you stopped being a teacher. And we're we're all being told at the moment about transferable skills, and you know a lot of musicians are being told we've all got to become electricians and all this sort of thing. <laughs> but, uh, you went you went from a teacher to music and do you think that that actually teaching gave you some useful skills that, that you've taken into your career as a singer yeah with, without a doubt and particularly for me as a recitalist um standing facing a, a, an audience in a recital space it is so similar to facing a classroom um that i'm sure the skills i learned uh, uh, um uh, particularly dealing with rowdy and, and uninterested uh, boys at school um, helped me to to be able to face a room full of people, and I'm able You're to be. Describing the Wigmore Hall audience there as well, aren't you? The, the yeah. rowdy, the rowdy crowd. Yes, the hecklers <laughs> at the back. And, and it would be lovely to think that the Wigmore Hall audience sits itself seats themselves in the same way that the Keenies are at the front. And then the ones at the back that you can't really see very well are the ones who are tuning out and wondering how soon it's going to be before the bell rings and they can go. <laughs> but uh, well, let's go but, on. Tell, tell me, but yes, but what what you've learned from 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 the teaching to me? It's only from that point of view, trying to hold the attention of a room in terms of being clear and uh, 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 clarity of enunciation. For one thing, I think uh, uh, I learned that as a school teacher. Um, and uh, people often comment to me about my diction and that's very very lovely and it's something that i think about a lot M more more in terms of wanting to be understood by everybody in the room to keep their attention otherwise like my old classes of old they will just naturally drift off um well, well that's it. this is um, an interesting point about something like leader which is, of course is often or chanson or it's often sung in a foreign language hmm. and that sense of communication through words because i know that words are very important to you and poetry i mean i mean you, you're a brilliant communicator in, in in words and 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 you can absolutely see that you have a sort of literary mind that you enjoy the way words work together hmm. uh, when you're communicating in in other languages which you have to do as a singer what what how do you make sure that that, that even if you don't understand the words, that there's something that you're conveying. Well, uh, it's important to me. It, it's important to me from nuts and bolts point of view in terms of doing my homework. It's, it is important for me to understand the words um, that, that I'm that I'm, I'm expressing. And uh, I think when I'm singing to someone, when I'm singing to an audience, part of me imagines in real time that they're understanding every word I sing. So uh, either I'm thinking that there's three native speakers in the room and I'm singing to them, or I'm imagining in some way that the audience will be able to understand every single word and every inflection to it in real time. Now, at the same time, there'll be another part of my brain that's thinking these poor, these, these poor people have got not the first clue what I'm singing about. <laughs> you know, the ones who've put their translations down late, ages ago and just sitting with their arms folded and just lapping it up for, as music. They're not getting every word, but I think it's possible for audiences to experience and enjoy it and get something really positive out of that experience regardless. Um, if I was a clarinetist playing the melodies of Schubert's Die Schöne Müllerin, for example, you could get a great deal of pleasure just, just from the sound of it, just from the harmony, just from the, the texture. 
So it doesn't matter that there's no language going on at all. So long as they're not, so long as they're not frustrated that all this time I'm speaking to them, I'm using a different language and they can't access it. As long as that doesn't frustrate and get in the way, then we're okay. If we, if we, for example, we, you and I suddenly switched this conversation into Serbo-Croat, for example. We'll try some Hindi if you like. But, uh... <laughs> very, very. <laughs> 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 my case in, in, in point it, it just um it, you could you could uh, the people watching now could tell a lot from our faces yeah. whether we're having a good time at all whether we're getting really serious or what you know, they could tell what's going on without necessarily understanding a word not less not not even one in every 10 or one in every 100 but there, there's a great deal we can communicate without that but it, I, I, without the music to accompany us in our conversation yes. um it could become dull quite quickly. <laughs> um, well, and of course, this takes us to the operatic stage because, of course, there you have you have you have the drama as well, and you're creating a character and a, and a role, and you're in costume, and and that gives you a sort of a, a, another persona to 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 inhabit. But I mean, did you always know that you could be on stage and you wanted to be on stage, and was was drama always a part of your um your 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 being? Uh, not at all, because at school, through school and through university, um, if there was something dramatic going on, I would, generally speaking, be in the in the orchestra pit. Um, uh, to, you know, in my sixth form days, I was conducting a few of these things, and if I wasn't I was playing the cello or playing something, hitting something with something else, somebody with something else. Um, so I, I didn't get much of an acting experience. However, the teaching, again, going back to acting, the teaching was, of course, an, a, an act. I would. I remember specifically some lessons where I'd go in and think, right, okay, I've really got to try and hold them now, and I'm, and they make me smile too quickly. So what I'll do is I'll go in and pretend I've got the most filthy hangover, and and I'll be in a filthy, filthy mood for the first half hour, and then I, you know, and then we'll light up, see how that goes, and I'd try that for a bit, and the pupils would, you know, realize, oh, Mr. Williamson's a bad mood today, you know, and after a while they'd begin to suss out that I couldn't hold it <laughs> for that long, but the people talk about teaching the legal profession many professions like that in terms of acting and i was very conscious of that as a school teacher it just so happened that i went to the guild hall to train on the opera course there as i was approaching my uh, approaching my 30th birthday and uh and we had acting lessons and stage experience and i stumbled across something that i really enjoyed because for me it's the play aspect of it the dressing up um, other people's clothing and um, and well I don't know how can I best express it mucking about um, as part of one's job being able to explore aspects of my own character and aspects of human behavior in a safe environment um, I really really loved that really enjoyed it and the, the best thing for me of course because I'm a musician um, is I responded to the the music as well rather than thinking this is great I must get myself to rada and, and join the join the the the, the straight theatre the RSC. Now, it, for me, it's it's that it's underpinned by music. Just just um, uh, we, we've got a very nice uh, question that's just come in. So I, I I will ask that in a second. But I just wanted before we forget to bring bring that um, a point out that you actually didn't really start um, uh, at the, at the Guildhall until you were in, until you were thirty. Um, and that's quite late. And um, I think a lot of singers through all this uh, stuff with COVID is uh, um, they sort of think, well, you know, I'm in my mid 20s. Um, I've, I've lost my opportunities. Um, my career's not going to go anywhere. But I think, you know, you, judging by what, what's happened to you, there is there is a sort of a, a, a way of doing things later on in life. Yeah, I think especially with singing, as opposed to other forms of, of music making, instrumental and piano and what have you, um, singing there, and also particularly with men, and I'm sorry to say that, but I think there is a truth in that at the moment, that um, it's expected that, that deeper voices like mine, baritone and bass baritone voices develop more and more as one gets older. Um, uh, and so you don't have to uh, have been doing this since, um, uh, it, oh, doing this to a certain extent since one was, uh, 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 as a, in a professional sense, since one was um, a student. Of course, I was a treble. I was a core scholar as an undergraduate, but with no potential of taking it further at that stage. So I have actually sung all my life, but I just never taken it to this level 
I never thought to take it to this level until I was yeah thirty ish. Well, let, let's just go back to uh, th that. Sort of brings me to to uh, the question that we have, which is uh, about education and about being a young person. And um, uh, our questioner says, um, "Amazing to hear your story, Roderick, and how you came to music. Um, what do you think about how the government is not really valuing music education?" Right. Well, this is this is a, a, a another can of worms. Let's take the lid off this one now. My my experience of music teaching in this country since I was a teacher is is anecdotal. So I haven't had a, a, a much experience of going into schools and dealing with the current curriculum. So my perception, I think, is 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 kind of everybody's perception that music is. <sighs> It is has been kind of wound down as an expensive luxury in in um, uh, in schools that are outside of private schools, which have always had wonderful resources and amazing concert halls. You know, build them, build another recital hall um, in the summer holidays, and there you go. So, I don't know if that's true, though. I don't know to what extent it's true, and I don't know to what extent the people who are trying to drive music in this country in for schools nationwide uh, I don't know what they're doing and 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 and, and so it, it would be a little bit difficult for me to comment it from a position of ignorance I, I think one of the problems seems to be that music isn't treated as a sort of a, a viable career it's not sort of seen as a qualification that will take you anywhere and I think I think um Again, it's this idea that either you're, you're, you go through the conservatoire route and, 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 and that's it, you're, you're on a career path, or you do something else because um, you're not going to be a musician. Whereas, in fact, I think there are many, many ways into music, perhaps, which aren't, which, 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 it, which aren't celebrated in a way. So. Sure. And one of the things that was uh, uh, trumpeted loud, pardon the pun, trumpeted loud, um, uh, loudly during the course of this is the amount of money that the arts and music in particular contributed to um, to, to the, the economy. Uh, as we were all saying that, we were all aware that it felt a bit hollow. We don't want to speak about arts and culture in term of how, terms of how much money it makes. We felt, feel like that's speaking someone else's language. They will only turn around and say, sorry, what? When we say you do realise we contributed I can't remember that you have to make up a number here, however many it is, million pounds to the British economy. I think trillions, we say anyway. Yeah. Exactly. It's, express it in trillions. Yeah. It, it, definitely. So we all, those of us who enjoy it and love it and, 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 and receive it or perform it, know that the value of this is, is nothing to do with how much money it makes. But that's, it is handy that it, it, that, that it, is, it is real. But... Um, there's there's also a feeling when you look at other countries because I travel obviously to work in other countries or I certainly did we might come on to that I travel to other countries and see how other countries uh, consider arts and any society that considers arts as an entertainment sort of you feel a bit that's a bit of a limp response a society that f that puts the arts r right in the center knowing that um, it feeds into everything we do. You talked earlier on about transferable skills, for example. All the studies that have ever been done that point out what to us is obvious, that, that learning an instrument or dealing with music helps you to concentrate, helps you to focus, helps you... I mean, God, do, do I need to list off... All, we all know, we all know instinctively what you know what music helps us do all those things every summer you have another newspaper report that says oh if you try um revising for your exams a little bit of classical music on in the background you know it, it's you know, all that stuff which we've which we've all known instinctively the ancient greeks knew it <laughs> you know music and mathematics together the fundamental thing so so the it, we all know that and we all see therefore uh that if a a national education framework says right you've got maths English, science, don't worry about languages, won't need those because you've got Google Translate, maths, English and science, and um, and then, you know, humanities and the artsy stuff, but we won't worry about them. You're, just, you're kind of missing the point, yeah. missing the point. So now, now let, let's, let's just move on. We've just had another quite interesting question here, um, which is perhaps you know, a bit, bit more controversial, which is that 
there's been a feeling, I think, in the in the singing world that um, through COVID, uh, that the, the, that companies have rallied around the big names um, because you know they they all want to get attention through their streaming and through their and that the big names uh, have got a bit of clout when it comes to, to lobbying for, for musicians and singers and. I count you as a big name. Um, but the question is, um, Roddy, is there anything you can do to help less well-known singers to get a share of the few perform performance opportunities that exist at the moment? I think there's been a feeling that, you know, perhaps uh, people at the start of their careers have been slightly frozen out. By the yes, day. absolutely. And, and that's the first thing that happened when everybody's diaries were wiped in mid-March. <clears throat> um, everybody's diaries were wiped globally. So that was the first thing. But the, as things began to come back, then for the reasons that you were beginning to hint at and that I hope are obvious to people, promoters look for, let's call them established names in order to begin the the slow claw back towards whatever we're aiming, aiming for. Yes, we can all understand why that is. And we can also see that anybody who, had, who has, was in a music conservatoire at the time or had recently finished in a few years, or anybody was just thinking of starting out as a singer or an instrumentalist or whatever, has no prospects whatsoever. If no choral societies are putting on Messiah up or creation up and down this country, then there's nowhere for younger artists to, to gain their first experience. And on top of that, if a, if a choral society does decide that, that they're going to chance a Messiah, you know, sometime soon, the number of people who are suddenly available and to do it, you know, would include the established artists. They could pick an established artist to come and sing in Messiah from because the established artist is free. <laughs> They've got an empty diary. So who do you want? Just ring them up. You could get whoever you wanted. So, yes, I entirely see that. Now, it could well be that question was sent to you by a, a, a Ms. B. Hannigan in order to be able to prompt me to speak about momentum, momentum now. Uh, Barbara Hannigan, Canadian soprano and conductor and all-round musical good egg, um, she called me in the middle of the summer and posed that exact question. And it was something I'd been thinking about, chatting with my wife about, what can we do? What can we do practically to try and, and scoop up people um, as, uh, as these opportunities come our way? She developed uh, an initiative called Momentum, and she put Momentum Now on it to differentiate it from anything political. Momentum is an idea of sharing those opportunities uh, in a very practical way. If I'm giving a recital, uh, for example, I might be able to invite a young, younger artist, maybe not so young, another person to come and share the platform with me. And in doing so, I would we'd be able to pay them um, through the Momentum scheme itself that has funds. Um, I might be able to contribute some of my fee and the promoter might be able to uh, put some money in. So the momentum artist, rather than being sort of coming along as some sort of intern sort of feel, um, um, some uh, sort of, what would you call it, sort of warm up act, they are actually properly sharing the stage. They are earning a solid fee and we are simply sharing those opportunities. So of the concerts I've done this autumn, for example, um, that actually happened, uh, I was able to share most of my recitals, not the Wigmore I just did a few days ago, but I'm singing Winterreiser on Saturday. To, yeah, Saturday. I'm sharing it with uh, uh, with a baritone, Peter Brathwaite, and the pianist, Kevil Shah. Um, and then two days later, I'm singing Schwanergesang. I've got bass, Edward Hawkins, and uh, soprano, uh, mezzo-soprano, uh, Catherine Rudge who are going to come along and join me for that. And I've got one in the future. I've done concerts in the past, the future. If whoever asked that question, if it wasn't Ms. B. Hannigan, do look up momentum artists as being a practical response from conductors, singers, instrumentalists, orchestras, promoters saying, yeah, let's share this opportunity and scoop people up. Otherwise there will be two to three years worth of, of uh, artists who've missed not only the wages, you know, just being able to support themselves, but also the experience of, of performing. And, and I will, this is a lengthy answer, but let me just also point out that I sang uh, with Kitty Waitley. We did a concert together in um, Snape when I shared Winterreiser with her. 
and he did a concert with the baritone Gareth Brynmore John. We did something in Liverpool and it would have repeated it in Sheffield, but that got cancelled in November. And in both occasions, they came off stage having performed for the first time in however many months. And both of them were rattling with the experience because they'd been out of practice of performance for so long. It was a shock to them. Um, it, we can all deal with nerves, performance nerves. We sort of inoculate ourselves by doing it so often. Yeah. But because there'd been that break, they both said they had a mad moment on stage. The inner voices kind of screaming in their ears. Oh my God, audience, what do we do? You know? Um, and I thought that was, I thought it was fascinating. I'd felt something similar back at the Wigmore in June, yeah. it, simply being on stage performing. Well I, well, I think even, you know, for, for people who aren't performing, the idea of walking into a, a space with, you know, a, a thousand people in the audience, um, having, you know, having sat at home for, for several months and, yeah. uh, and, and had very nice conversations with one's partners and one's dogs and cats. Yes. Um, I, I think that, that idea of actually just being with a lot of people which yes. being in the audience is, is going to be, you know, quite, quite, a, quite a frightening thing in some ways. Or perhaps Definitely. And, and for a singer like myself, the, the room I'm, I'm zooming from here is, is the room where I do my practice. It's not particularly large and, you know, I can make a filthy racket in here when I want to. But to make air vibrate in a large space again, uh, again, after a gap of several months, was, was physically quite an interesting challenge. I've just not been in a room larger than my kitchen. But, you know, and, and to, make, to make the air shake. That's what you know. It was. It was really something. So, so talking about making the 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 air shake, um, I've got another question here, which which takes you right back to the core of um, your what you do, and uh, which is uh, hopefully a simple question, but but without a simple answer, which is which character do you most enjoy playing? Which character do I most enjoy playing? Well, that's a great thing. Um... Or, or, or of course, I'm going to have to give you a few. I'm going to have to, 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 to farm this around a little bit. Uh, the Miller in Die Schöne Müllerin, I really enjoy playing that character. If you think I was about to mention an operatic character, um, I may have wrong-footed you there. But then in a sense, perhaps I perform that song cycle operatically in that I, I'm allowed to be one person from beginning to end with a journey and a story. I, I love being a teenager again for an hour and 10 minutes or whatever it is, um, even though it doesn't end well. But I... <laughs> I, I, I well, love I mean, being... teenage love very rarely ends well. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. I think I, I, I personally, as Roderick Williams, got away with it, actually. I, I, I managed to oh. one at life there. But that is a beautiful um, thing. I enjoy it every time. Another character I enjoyed hugely was Scarpia. I sang Scarpia at the Indelian Festival, for, oh gosh, at least 10 years ago, if not 15. Someone will know exactly when, but not me. Um, and in a small church in North Cornwall, packed with my friends and colleagues and what have, uh, have you, I wasn't expected to make a, a huge noise of it. I'm a lyric baritone, but it was, it was just so wonderful to explore such an evil, manipulative, manipulative um, damaged character. Yeah, manipulative, definitely. Um, I, I found that really exciting, really interesting. And, and that, the bad that, is a good, you know, good to that, good to play. That is interesting because, of course, where do you find it in yourself to find those reserves of evil? Do you think, presumably, mm -hmm. that they're in all of us? That that um, you know, as somebody who seems like such a good, balanced, non psychopathic person, <laughs> um, it's easy. It's easy to play in 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 one sense if you don't bring too much of yourself to to, to work. You know, if <laughs> I don't bring my inner psychopath. No, you know, but, but yeah, you, you are making it absolutely the, the, the correct point that um, that I hope from a position of being reasonably well balanced in my life, I am able then to spend more time exploring what lurks in my psyche um, uh, um, to bring a character like that to life for myself. Now, how successful I was at really um, convincing people that I was capable of such acts and such words would be for a blessing. Would be for other people to um, to to say. But for me, um, the words are all there. The music's all there. The only way I could soften Scarpia is by changing the words and by, by changing some of his decisions and, and by not torturing um, uh, uh, the, the, the poor tenor, you know. Um, but 
But, you know, it's all in the text and it's all in that music. So and, all I have to do is write it. And I suppose that, that sort of takes me to another point about how resilient you have to be as a performer. I mean, we're talking about the empowered musician here. And, you know, what do you need? Do you think you need a particular mindset to um, and a particular sort of mental resilience to, to do what you do? And is it something innate or is it something you can learn? Yeah, I, I'll deal with the innate and can you learn it? I'll, I'll work that out in my mind as I'm going here, as I, as I begin talking. Uh, I think resilience is good to have and particularly for singers because um, I, have it, I have worked out the more I sing that it's very difficult for me to, to, to do it physically, to make the noise if I'm not feeling right. If it, it, I am, as you can tell, quite a positive, valiant person. The times when I have been knocked sideways by something, um, uh, I haven't experienced proper grief. So I'll just hang on there. It'll hit us all someday. But um, I've had a very wonderful, charmed life so far. Touch a bit of wood, what have you. So I haven't had to, to cope with real knockbacks. But but I I remember at the funeral of Richard Hickox. Um, his death and his funeral caught me completely unawares. And as we stood in St. Daniel Church to sing hymns, I was standing next to a non-singer. He was able to sing. I couldn't make a note. I couldn't make a note in my throat. I just, it's just, so, so I point that out only in the, in that, other mechanical instruments, you can get a noise out of them, however you feel. I mean, debatable. But for me, the singing, if I'm not feeling right, I cannot do it. So it's quite easy for someone, a conductor or a director, it's quite easy for them to undermine a person, undermine me, if they, if, if that's how they want to. And if they want to break me down, to build me up, as that, you know, people used to do before um, bullying out was, was outlawed. Um, and in such circumstances, I can't really function. And I have, I have had very, hmm, no one's really treated me particularly badly, but there are certainly times uh, when I've needed to, uh, I've been conscious I need to be strong. One of those, for example, might be in the recording studio where uh, voice and pianos, a solo disc, a duet disc, I should say. And, um, and I am aware that I, I need to maintain my strength in every sense, mental and physical strength, from the beginning of the day to the end of the day, three days in a row, if it's yeah. gonna work. That, that's, that's, that's good to know. And, and um, here's a question that actually sort of leads on for that. Um, and I think it's, it's probably by, you know, the question is probably from somebody who's been um, sitting at home quite a lot. And uh, I know I know that I go out and sort of you know I've, I've mowed the lawn more often than ever before because I'm at home and you know and and anything to avoid sitting by my computer and working. Yeah. Um, this particular question says, how do you motivate yourselves to practice if you don't have performances to aim for? So how do you keep that sort of practice going? Well, the short answer to that was when it all went uh, uh, belly up in um, March. I didn't sing a note three months, you know, until I got that Wigmore. Um, uh, 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 offer and uh, the offer from from Wasfi. Um, I didn't practice at all. It's, it, it. I do. It's probably hum and sing a lot. Generally speaking, when I'm around place and busy, but um, I didn't take the opportunity to learn a new role or practice and and th stuff that I thought I might do. I just didn't sing. So th there's a short answer to how do you motiv motivate yourself? I don't know. I didn't. I didn't motivate myself. But circumstances, of course, have changed, and I've become busy in the last few months. And so there's a great motivation there to to learn things and and keep things going. Um, uh, and it's it's wonderful for me to hear uh, the various members of my family. I don't have any singers particularly in the family, I, but my family do enjoy music. But I really enjoy hearing them sing around the house when they don't know that they're being listened to. People okay. who just make make a noise, including my, my wife, she doesn't do it very often, but I, it, it's, it's, it's gorgeous because then they, that's a true expression of something coming out of them. And that I find really beautiful. Uh, uh, that is something I would hang on to. It's not an answer to your question. 
Not a good answer to the question, well, but no, it's an no, observation. And, and, and it does actually slightly lead on to our next question, which is oh, that good. singing with other people. Um, yes. so can you give us an insight into the rehearsal process when working alongside musicians from different nationalities? Oh, this is that's an interesting question, very specifically about other nationalities, because people people do have different backgrounds. Uh, the English choral background from which I come is a is a is a passport, you know, a calling card, um, and language is a thing. I remember doing a production in Israel of an opera in French, and most of the front that the cast were French speakers. Um, and I felt on the outside of that, you know, when you want to relax at the end of rehearsal, they go and get a beer somewhere. I couldn't take part. My conversational French is not good enough to take part, particularly when I, I can see that they want to relax. They've been concentrating all the day. You don't, they don't want to have to start speaking in English and they want to let their hair down and, you know, I could see that. So in actual fact, I ended up bonding with the, with the Swedish uh, mezzo and a, and a Russian Israeli um, soprano because they were more comfortable speaking in English. So actually, it's simply on a social level, that's how things divided. And of course, that social division then sort of is part of the performance. I perform, I had much more of a rapport on stage with the people I knew well. Um, I wonder if this is, this is where your question of thought that question was going to go. <laughs> yeah. but, I have also, I have one colleague who, colleague who always sticks in my mind, um, who um, she had come to this country to work with one of our national opera companies. Um, and she was the only person from her country. And we were all, the rest of us all Brits together. And we did our very best to include her. I mean, really tried hard to include her, but, but she came with her armor on and, uh, I, it was quite intriguing to observe her take steps not to blend, not to let her guard down, not not really. I think we won her over by the very end of the rehearsal period. She was, you know, prepared to trust us. It was it's all about trust, actually. Yeah. Well, I, I, I'm sure you I'm sure you did win her over because you're a very um, charming, uh, winning sort of chap. So um, Ooh, I charmed, yeah. I charmed. I can tell you, I really charmed. My goodness. Well, I think I think one of the things that this leads to is is the idea of scrutiny. The fact that you know, perhaps as a performer, uh, because of Zoom and because of streaming and because of opera on film, and you know, you're you're looked at, you're scrutinised much more than than you were. And you know, the fact that I'm talking to you in mm. your kitchen means that perhaps there's a mystique that 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 natural armour that you have as a performer has been broken down through this whole COVID process, and that and that you are you know, you are more real to people than, than perhaps you would have been before. And, and, and um, you know, the whole idea of celebrity has changed, for example. Mm. I mean, do you, do you miss that sort of um, persona that, that's different from the, the, the real world that singers used to have and perhaps don't anymore? Again, I think I've been used to this to a certain extent to all my performing life. I've never sought to, um, to uh, in all my acting, like I was saying about, you know, being a school teacher and trying to act um, um, uh, in a certain way. I've never really been aware of that in my, uh, in, in any part of my career. And in fact, I've just been reading the memoirs of Helmut Deutsch, the fantastic Austrian uh, uh, a collaborative pianist, accompanist. He actually refers to himself as an accompanist, so I can call him that. Uh, translated by Richard Stokes into a very, very readable um, uh, Christmas book, everybody. It's fabulous. And he, he, Helmut is 75 now. He bridges the gap between the superstars of the 1970s, say, through to youngins, younger than me, the next generation. And it's fascinating to read his book to see how that has changed. I very much belong to the back end of that story. So for me, this, the breaking down of mystique and barriers is how I've always been, how I've always wanted to be. Um, I don't understand it when people, I don't, I don't um, uh, respond when people attempt to put me on a pedestal. I don't get that. Whereas some of the great superstars that Helmut played with when Helmut was young and when he was starting out, and the stories there are, are just staggering. I mean, it makes a great reading. Um, and the sort of, the, the lengths they would go to to ensure their superstar diva appeal it's amazing i just you wouldn't you wouldn't get away with that now um 
It, 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 he, there's one, for example, it's just something that pops into my head. He's talking about working with Hermann Prey, the, the, the great German baritone who was the, always the rival to Fischer Dieskel. And Helmut just makes a point. There was one point towards the end of his career, he was doing these massive German tours of recital programs, 12, 15 concerts in a row. And Helmut says he was one of the last artists who could seriously complain that the tour of Germany had not been organized geographically. So just that's the idea that one promoter would have to ring up another to ensure that the dates made a logical car journey from one to the next. I think, my goodness, imagine that kind of superstar power. Uh, no, that's well, now, now, um this is this is this brings us to another question here, which is um, you know, how the world connects and the fact that you could go from one country to another easily. And um, this this is a question that I think is quite an ISM question, really, which is, um, as a young singer, I'm petrified about Brexit limiting my career before it's even started. Do you have any tips for how to overcome a no deal? Well, you know, very few of our politicians have tips, but um, mm. if you can enlighten us, that would be absolutely marvellous. I wish I could. <laughs> and of course, you know as well as I do, and your correspondent knows that the answer is nobody knows at the moment. Um, few things uh, upset me, trouble me. Few, few things. One of the things that is actually worrying me as I speak is that I'm due to begin rehearsals in Amsterdam on the 4th of January. So the practical implications uh, are of, of trying to begin uh, uh, several weeks of rehearsal in, in, in Amsterdam uh, with slightly less than a month to go, yeah, ex almost, no, exactly a month to go, coping with Brexit and quarantining COVID at the same time is, is a nightmare. Fortunately for me, and you're, this is probably not true for your correspondent as a, as a younger performer, fortunately for me, I've got a wonderful team of people who are engaged right now, uh, rather than watching this, engaged right now in, in trying to sort that for me with the opera company on their side to try and smooth it over. So uh, I'm in a wonderful position where I can tune into the odd email and check how it's going. And that's not going to help your correspondent at all. Well, no, I, I mean, I, I think, you know, one of, one of the things we can start with in terms of lobbying is to have some sort of special talent visa that, you know, or a talent yeah. visa, just as sports people can go and compete abroad um, and not have to quarantine when they come yeah. back because they have a special uh, dispensation to do so. I think professional musicians who are working with, you know, bona fide companies and, and in, a, in, a, in a state that's going to help their career, um, I think they need a, a, a sort of dispensation of some sort. Well, I can tell you that my diary as it stands for the first six months of next year um, relies on exactly what you described becoming an instant reality. Otherwise, I'm not sure quite what language I can use on this. Uh, this. <laughs> Otherwise, I might be <laughs> in a, slightly discomforted. I mean, I, I will I will lose work. Stuff that's in the diary now, it, it, if quarantine, for one thing, uh, re remains a thing in its current form pre-vaccine, I'm, I'm stuffed. I think I can say stuffed, can't I? I can say stuffed. <laughs> I'm stuffed. Secondly, um, the number of days one's allowed to be in Europe, in the, in, the, in the EU, with it rolling in the way it's going to, you know, 19 days, 90 days within a six month period. These were, these were headlines. These are things I noticed in the newspaper the other day. And I just looked at it and thought, 90 days in a six month period. I got my diary out and started counting. And oh my God, you know, I'm, I've got this, this, this job that starts in Amsterdam, works there, then goes to, um, uh, uh, goes to Germany. Um, and, you know, I'm starting to do the maths and this, 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 this could be me. Um, uh, and and it, rather than um, a situation where when I get to my 90th day, armed police arrive at my door and, f f you know, frog march me to Schiphol Airport, it's not going to be, it's just going to cost me an awful lot more and it's going to be a lot of red tape and and stuff so 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 your, your the person who asks the question is waiting for a nugget of something that's going to help him or her and all i can say is i have nothing because nobody knows the answer i'm sharing your pain and 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 practically with a month to go trying to work this out for myself to make sure i can actually do the job i'm i'm booked to do there's so much money riding on my being there to do this particular project. Well, what, what I'd say to that young singer, um, if I may, is that, is that as a musician, as you know, that 
increasingly um, you have to know how to lobby and how to campaign and how to, I mean, it's another aspect of what a musician has to do. And I think that, you know, we can't just be in our ivory towers. I think we have to, uh, um, I mean, I've, we've just, uh, here we are, I'm, I'm promoting this a bit, but um, we're, we've just started a new website called Classical Music UK, uh, which is there to be an industry lobbying, uh, just as the ISM is, and we're, we're working closely with the ISM and we're doing something a little bit different, more journalistic maybe, but, um, but, all of us as musicians need, need need to be able to say, you know, we need to fight for what we do because it's not just going to happen. So, mm -hmm. so just mm -hmm. all join together in a voice. We know how to perform. We know how to cre be creative. Mm -hmm. We know how to um, really think on our feet. Mm -hmm. uh, and now's the time to do it. Yeah, yeah. Well, well. Uh, amen to that because it could well be. It, 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 the, the thing about um, political decisions like this, beyond COVID, but political decisions like this, is that when it doesn't affect you it doesn't affect me i can get on with my stuff sing my music and it all rolls on past me and, and oh i see another newspaper article about it but it doesn't seem to touch me so i don't have to concern myself with it but this is concern this is you know affecting what happens for me in 2021 yeah. a great deal of 2021 so i i will be engaging in your website because yeah. Thank you. I have to. I have you, do, to. you do write for us. All of us write for us. So all of you write for us. So um, one of the things um, we should ask is about uh, in, a, in a fantasy world where COVID is gone, we've all been vaccinated. What, what would you be most looking forward to in the future? What's your Christmas wish? This is a question I've just had. Um, one of the things I'm looking forward to is, is walking on stage at the Wigmore Hall and seeing it full again. Um, I think that's going to be emotional to a point where I'm choking even even talking to you about it uh, just just to hear the place alive with people who want to hear live music again um, that's going to be quite overwhelming um, so I'm looking forward to that I'm looking forward to being on an operatic stage again and being able to um, being able to interact with my colleagues without uh, having to dance around them at two meters. It was fascinating doing Lab OM with the English National Opera and Ali Pali. There are a lot of people who didn't realize that we were keeping two meters apart or as much as we could, and generally we could, and didn't see the intricate stage dancing going on around. <laughs> when someone approaches a, pop, uh, a prop, you have to back off it and all this sort of stuff. Um, I, want to, I want to be in contact with my colleagues again. I need to touch them that, that, that I felt it uh, really keenly when I saw Carolyn Sampson after a long period of time and she sang we did a concert at St Martin in the Field um, back in September October and she sang the Pia Jesu from the Freire Requiem um, and in that church she sang it in such a way that it just it, it, it melted us all it was such a beautiful sound and she's such a pro she just knows what she's doing and yeah. it, uh, I, I felt a need to hug her and make contact because she's an old friend not not old she's not an old friend she's a friend sorry <laughs> delete that bit she's a friend she's a friend sorry carolyn and uh, to, just to, just to make human contact with her and all we could do is sort of i could stand to me so that was really really beautiful you know well i, I mean i have to say really just in the last um uh, sort of minute and a half that we've got left um oh, yes it's been it's been absolutely amazing talking to you fantastic really wonderful um but um you know i think one of the things we're all looking forward to uh, is is getting together again and, and one of the things that this whole experience has i think taught us is how absolutely essential and 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 more than valuable music is that music mm. is such a central part of our lives and maybe maybe it's taken a few months of uh, of not not having it to to make us really really appreciate yes. absolutely um and um i suppose it you know it really just remains for me to say keep up all the amazing work that, that, that you're doing I mean, it's 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 always inspirational and, and you're always wonderful to watch um and um, just tell us again what you're going to do on saturday so that we can all, all be there so, so saturday you can find me at st john smith square as london's in tier two there will be audience allowed um there's a performance at three and one later in the evening maybe seven seven thirty something like that uh winterizer shared between me and peter brathwaite with kevil Shah at the piano and on monday it's schwanigazang over at st john's in waterloo there we are. So the music goes on. Thank you very, very much, Roddy. Um, I think we should wish everybody a happy Christmas. Thank you for your yes. wonderful things. Um, we hope you've enjoyed this session, and um, and um, you know, perhaps we'll be back for more. It was, it was, it was, it was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Ash. Thank you. See you soon.
Yes, sir.